Good afternoon and welcome to our Missouri Prairie Foundation webinar, How Plants Work, Plant Physiology in 50 Minutes with Dr. Michelle Bow. My name is Erica. I'm the Special Projects Coordinator for the Missouri Prairie Foundation, and I want to thank you all for joining us for this webinar today. During the presentation, if you have any questions, please put those in the Q&A section on your screen. And at the end, MPF Executive Director Carol David will read those out to Dr. Bow. This webinar is being recorded and the link will be shared with all of you tomorrow, along with resources mentioned during the presentation and the Q&A session. And now for some background on Dr. Michelle Bow. Michelle Bow grew up in South Carolina, where she explored the woods and meadows with her childhood best friend and became fascinated by all of the plant life around creeks and in the forest. In high school, she made a leaf collection that she still has, and the species are still among those that she currently teaches. She went to Wofford College in South Carolina as a biology major and fell in love with botany. She then pursued a PhD at Vanderbilt University studying seed plant evolution using molecular data and morphology. Her first faculty position soon followed at Frostburg State University in Maryland, and then in 2002, she moved to Springfield to teach at Missouri State University. Courses she's taught include plant taxonomy, identification of woody plants, vascular plant morphology, and applications of molecular techniques. We're excited to have Dr. Bo here today to learn more about how plants work. And now I will turn it over to Dr. Bo. All right, so I'm gonna be talking about some very basic things about photosynthesis, a little bit about water transport and a very small amount about the hormones that control all these things. So plants, you probably already knew this, but plants and other green organisms like algae have the unique ability to make light, to use light to make food. And the food is starts off generally in the form of sugar, but um, other things are made too. And then ultimately that gives the, us food for all life on earth. Now the, the unique part is the light using part because um, all living organisms are made up of cells and cells by definition and life by definition is made up of cells that can grow, reproduce, and they have a metabolism. So they, they're, they're doing things in the cell and they can respond to their environment. And all of these things require some kind of energy. And the energy is typically in the form, stored in the form of food, which is what we call chemical en energy. Now, if you think about a tree growing in the forest or a prairie, um, you might see that it has leaves, first of all, and that it also produces wood. And then you end up with a lot of biomass. So I'm using a tree as an example, but it, biomass can be anything from the plants that are in the soil um, to the tree trunks themselves. And so the question is, how do they do this? And basically, one thing you have to keep in mind is that even though plants are not animals, I mean, they still have organs just like animals do, and leaves are the organs that drive photosynthesis. And that's their main purpose. So plants wouldn't have leaves if, if photosynthesis wasn't something that was going to happen. So, so another question that arises is, and is, is one of these things that sounds like it ought to be something complicated because wood is a very, it's a solid, um, it's, it's, it's lasts for a long time. So what is this actually made of? And we'll come back to that you know, at the end. So in this talk, first I'm going to talk about photosynthesis going into the light. And then a little bit about water transport because that's related to photosynthesis and then hormones that control all the other things going on in the plant. So if we look at a leaf, and first let me, so I take a leaf and then do a cross section, just cut across it like this, and look at the layers of cells inside the leaf. What we find is that on the up, upper side and the lower side, there is something called the epidermis, which is basically the skin of the plant. And then in the epidermis, there are little openings called stoma. And there's a stoma on this lower epidermis and one on the upper epidermis. And then inside the leaf, there's mostly what we call parenchyma cells. Parenchyma cells are the primary photosynthetic cells of the plant. So all the chloroplasts and so forth are in the parenchyma cells. So there's several other things I wanna point out about this, cell, this leaf cross-section. One is that this bottom layer of parenchyma has a lot of air in between the cells. And the air is where water can 
escape and carbon dioxide can go in. So it's where all the gas exchange occurs so that this air is necessary. So this, this structure is part of the, is related to the physiology of the plant. And then in the center here, we have a bundle, a vascular bundle. This is where xylem and phloem are. And xylem, or a vein is another word for the vascular bundle. And xylem carries water throughout the plant and phloem carries the food that the plant makes throughout the rest of the plant. So that's what's in a leaf. And basically photosynthesis occurs in the parenchyma, like I said. Sometimes this is called mesophyll. So you might see, and, and depending on the textbook, if you're looking at um, photosynthesis or a leaf cross-section, sometimes it's just called mesophyll, spongy and palisade because they're, they look like um, columns. Now, a couple of very, very important things that I don't wanna gloss over because we'll come back to these near the end, but virtually, all leaves have, a, all land plant leaves, let, let's say that, not aquatic plants, but land plant leaves have a cuticle, which is thick enough to keep the water inside the plant. So if the stoma are closed, water does not escape from the leaf most of the time, unless it's just super, super dry. So, so plants can regulate water coming in and out by closing or opening the stoma, and water does not generally go through the cuticle. So that, that gives plants the ability to live on land and not have to be in the water. Okay, so if we go back to our cell, what I want to point out with this cell is not, I'm not going to have you like, memorize all the cellular parts or anything, but I want to point out that most of the cell organelles are made up of membranes. And so we have one just, it's just basically just a membrane, the endoplasmic reticulum. The nucleus has a membrane around it. The chloroplast has has two membranes around it and has stacks of membranes. So lots of membranes here. This is a membrane bound organelle, the vacuole. And then there, there's a, a plasma membrane around the whole cell and mitochondria have membranes throughout them. Now I'm gonna focus in on the mitochondria here for just a second. So these little guys right here are mitochondria. So mitochondria are important because what, that, what they do is basically break down food. So if we start from already having food, then mitochondria goes through a process called respiration that basically converts glucose into a, a, a compound known as ATP. So this whole process is called respiration. Respiration requires oxygen to, to be, um, which is why it's called respiration, <laughs> um, but basically we, to break down glucose and make it into ATP, you need, you need oxygen. But the byproducts of this are water and carbon dioxide. So all, all cells that are, uh, unless they are um, anaerobic cells, have to have respiration. And so all cells will release carbon, uh, carbon dioxide and water. Now ATP, so this ATP molecule is a very important molecule in the cell and it's required for just about everything that goes on in the cell. So all of that growth and um, responding and everything else, reprodu reproducing and everything else have, uh, requires ATP. So if you look at a cell without um, drawing it <laughs> and just look at actual cells, what you notice is there's a bunch of little green things inside the cell. Those are all chloroplasts. So, that, so chloroplasts will show up without staining because they are green and they have chlorophyll in them. So most plant cells contain many, many chloroplasts. Um, there's one exception to that, and that is a hornwort. Hornwort cells only have one chloroplast, and that's one way to tell a hornwort from a liverwort. Now, if you look at a chloroplast and kind of blow one up, what you notice is that there are these columns and these stacks of what are called thylakoid membranes. And then, so this is all membranes, membranes, membranes. And a, a, one stack of them is called a grana, grana for one and grana for plural. Um, and then there's a, an inner membrane and an outer membrane of the whole chloroplast. And then there's the liquid part in the middle called the stroma. Now, photosynthesis is occurring pretty much in the, the, the light reactions photosynthesis occurring across these stacks of thylakoid membranes. So the membranes, again, are very, very important. So here is a, a sketch of a membrane. It's a ph phospholipid bilayer. So we have these phospholipids here. And then we have the proteins and pigments that allow photosynthesis. So here's our chloroplast with the stacks of membranes. And all of this, this is the, basically the light reactions of photosynthesis. So it's what happens in the light. And they're occurring across these thylakoid membranes. 
So the structure of the chloroplasts and the cells themselves is very important in how this all works. Now, what I want to note uh, that's of special importance is that plants have the ability to split water. And so it's basically like electrolysis, except different. <laughs> but but um, then they, they do this using mostly chlorophyll, but other pigments also. And when, once water is split, the electrons are released and excited. And then they go across the membrane and produce uh, things like NADPH and ATP. We'll come back to that in a second. But ATP and NADPH are produced at, as a, an end result of light reactions. So if we look a little bit closer at the photosystems that are involved in photosynthesis, photosystems are basically conglomerations of proteins and, and um, pigments that are there to A, split water, and B, to excite electrons, the electrons from the water, so that they can go down this electron transport chain. Electron transport chains are very important in most metabolism and most physiology of cells because this is where all of the ATP is made and NADPH is also made. Now, I, I glossed over the pigment idea, but chlorophyll is the main pigment for the light reactions of photosynthesis. And you notice it's got a magnesium core and then it's got a long tail. And this, this basically absorbs light and it enables water to be split and it excites electrons in the process. Now, uh, where it absorbs light is really important. So it absorbs light in, mostly in the violet and the red range. And I'm going to show you a, a spectrum, absorption spectrum of chlorophyll here in a minute. But basically, chlorophyll appears green because it's reflecting the green light. So this is the absorption spectrum of visible light of chlorophyll. So chlorophyll, the peaks indicate where uh, light is absorbed by chlorophyll. So it's absorbed here in the violet range and then over here in the red range. The green range is not, not absorbed at all. And basically this is um, reflected. And so that's why the chlorophyll looks green. Now, if we go to back to our photosystems, um, basically we have a con conglomeration of pigments and proteins in each photosystem. And we start with photosystem two. Uh, this is where the light reaction starts. Oops. Um, and then it goes to photosystem one. The photosystems are named one and two based on when they were discovered, so not where they appear in line. <laughs> and, but I'll come back to this in just a second. Now, the, the other part of, of photosynthesis occurs in the stroma of the chloroplast, and it's um, in this liquid part. Actually, I'm going to go back here in just a second. Okay, I think we I think I already talked about all of this, but just to, just a reminder, we have say chlorophyll here, and this P680 is a chlorophyll that's that's absorbing light at 680 nanometers, and it excites the electrons at that wavelength, and then they are passed through some other other pro proteins that um, are part of an electron transport chain. In this process, ATP is formed, and lots of ATP is formed during electron transport chains goes basically as the energy levels of the electrons go down, ATP is formed. And then this um, a P700 absorption chlorophyll also absorbs light in photosystem one after uh, ATP is produced. And then this goes to produce NADPH. NADPH is then used in the, the light independent reactions. All of this happening in the membranes of the thylakoids this all requires light. And so this is all happening in, in the light. Now, the second part of photosynthesis is called light ind independent because it does not require light, but it usually does occur during the light uh, when it's light outside because that's when the NADPH and ATP are becoming available. So the, the light independent reaction goes by several different names. Carbon fixation, because carbon is basically fixed from carbon dioxide into food. It's also called the Calvin cycle, named after the person who described it. Um, but what's, what's going on here? So you notice it's a, it's a cycle and there are several chemicals involved. Well, first of all, um, carbon dioxide is taken in by the stomata and then joined to ribulose one 5 bisphosphate which is a five carbon compound. That then forms two three carbon compounds, three phosphoglycerate. 
And then that's why sometimes this is called C3 photosynthesis. Then um, that uses up ATP and NADPH to make glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate. And this is a lot of chemicals, but the important part is, is really the ATP and NADP came from the light reactions and are now being used in the Calvin cycle. This um, glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate then goes on to make sugar, makes one sugar, and then the rest of it goes back into the cycle as ribulose 1 5 bisphosphate again. So sugar and fatty acids and amino acids and other things, not just sugars, we tend to focus on sugar because ultimately we end up with something like wood, which is a, a polymerized sugar pretty much. But in any case, ATP is used in this step also to, to regenerate regulose one 5 bisphosphate. And then carbon dioxide goes back into the system and uh, is added again. And then this, this just continues as long as there is a, ATP and NADPH available. And remember that is um, produced by the light reactions. So maybe that's when 5 bisphosphate is regenerated and basically the last step of the cycle. And then the cycle starts over. Now, all of this would not be possible if it weren't for a special enzyme called Rubisco. And Rubisco is the enzyme that takes carbon dioxide and adds it to ribulose 1,5 bisphosphate. So I want to talk a little bit about Rubisco and a couple of things about it. Um, first of all, here is a kind of a depiction of Rubisco on the molecular level, and it's made up of small and large subunits. It turns out that the large subunit of Rubisco is transcribed by a gene called RBCL. The small subunit is called RBCS. The RBCL is transcribed in or transcribed from genes that are found in the chloroplast itself. So this originates in the chloroplast. And it turns out that this protein, Rubisco, is the most abundant protein on Earth because it, it's necessary basically for all life on Earth as we know it. So uh, this is basically the carbon dioxide fixing protein. So it's called Rubisco. For regulus 1,5 bisphosphate carboxylate oxide, oxygenase, if I can say that. So if you're wondering about this DNA that you find in chloroplast, so the picture of the chloroplast didn't have any DNA in it, and that's just because DNA is really small. Um, but in chloroplast, it's a circular molecule, about 121,000 base pairs. And um, this one is from a liverwort. And these are the genes that, are, that you can map out on, um, on one of the pieces of chloroplast DNA. So this is a chromosome. It's just a circular chromosome, it's unlike the linear chromosomes that humans have. But here is Rubisco, the large subunit gene for, um, for that protein. So to kind of just summarize photosynthesis as a whole, first you have to have water, and then, um, then that mix with light and chlorophyll gives us NADPH and ATP. So we need a lot of that for the next part of the re reactions. And then we add carbon dioxide and then ribulose one 5 bisphosphate and Rubisco, the protein. And that combined with the NADPH and ATP eventually gives us sugar and other compounds. Now, if you wanted to see what the, the actual chemical formulas look like, we, we really start off with 12 waters, six carbon dioxide, and that gives us one glucose plus six water and six oxygen. So notice that oxygen is a byproduct of photosynthesis and oxygen is in turn used during respiration to break down this glucose. So respiration is practically the reverse of this equation. And then the other thing that I wanna mention is the water. Water is really key here because you have to have water and you, you would not have um, any of the wood or sugar or anything else if we didn't have water to begin with, the water and the carbon dioxide. Now, th th that's a problem though, for several reasons. Um, so one of the reasons that water is a problem is because in order to get carbon dioxide, the stomata have to be open. So if you remember the stomata cells in the epidermis, if, if those stoma are open, then water can escape and water can evaporate out. And if it, if it is hot outside, then water is going to evaporate at a faster rate. Now, 
but at the same time, this evaporation that goes through the stomata pulls the water through from the roots. So root hairs absorb water and then through capillary action, just like a straw or something like that, you can pull the water through and essentially stems are like little straws <laughs> that pull water through to the leaves. And the whole purpose, well, there's no purpose exactly for pulling the water through other than you need the water, but also you need the stomata to be open to get carbon dioxide. So, so water needs to come in through the roots somehow, and then um, carbon dioxide has to get in through the leaves. So since water molecules do stick to each other and they're cohesive and adhesive, they'll pull water through, through from the xylem cells. So xylem is a very important part of, of the plant tissue. And what I want to note about, so going back to this wood concept, wood is basically xylem cells, but lignified. And lignin is another carbohydrate that's, that's made up, that makes the wood hard. So if we look at root structure, um, what we notice is that in your standard root, if you go up a little bit past where, where there, it's growing, this is the growing section of the root, you end up with all these little root hairs. Now, they, these are single-celled hairs, and they're part of the uh, epidermis of the root. But that's where all the water is absorbed. So water is absorbed here, 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 here. This is why if you transplant a, a, a plant and you tear up the root cell, the root hairs, the plant will die because it needs it needs all of these little tiny things and they're very fragile. So um, so you have to be really careful transplanting things because if the root hairs break off, then you're gonna you're gonna be in trouble. But eventually the water is all funneled into the xylem, which is in the center of the root. And then this carries water throughout the rest of the plant. So this is just a couple of these are just a couple of um, diagrams of root structures from dicots and monocots. Again, most of um, what root hairs take in is simply water. It, it, when you think about other micronutrients, and if you were to grow plants using hydroponics, you might add a lot of extra nutrients. And th those things are necessary, but if you've ever looked at the ingredients in hydroponics, most of most of the main ingredient is just simply water. The other um, compounds or molecules just kind of come in with the water. So plants don't have a special mechanism just to take in other compounds. They, have, they take in water and then by default take in other things that they need, like um, minerals and so forth. And throughout the plant, throughout the stem and with the root first and then the stem, these cells are lined up end to end like straws all the way through the plant, all the way up into the leaves. And then that's where you have the bundle sheath cells and the bundles, the, the veins in the leaves. So if we go back to our leaf cross section, basically um, water comes in to, into the leaf through xylem cells. So these are some xylem cells here. here. Um, and, and water gets into this area where photosynthesis is occurring. These, these cells with the little rings on them are also xylem cells. Now there's one problem in addition to losing water. If you open stomata or stoma, no, stoma is singular and stomata is plural. If you open them, then water can escape. And, and if, they're, if it's windy or hot, then a lot of water can escape. And that's okay because as long as there's water available to the roots, water will still be taken in. But once water is gone from the root area, then there's no more water and no more photosynthesis. So that's one problem. Another problem is that rubis rubisco is not a picky enzyme. And so remember, I made a big deal about rubisco. Rubisco is the protein that takes carbon dioxide and adds it to rubiculose one five bisphosphate, and it ultimately makes our food. Well, the problem is if the stomata are closed, say it's a hot day, stomata are closed because we don't want to lose all that water. There's no more water available. So if stomata are closed, then rubisco can use oxygen. Well, if rubisco uses oxygen, that's called photorespiration. And basically nothing is made. So it's a very wasteful process, of photorespiration. So it happens in the light because, um, because that ATP and NADPH are available in the light. 
but no food is made. And so again, it's a wasteful process. So Rubisco combined two oxygen instead of carbon dioxide. It prefers carbon dioxide, but if carbon dioxide is not available and, and oxygen is, then it will, rebond, will bind to oxygen. So you don't, but you don't want this happening all the time. So what that does is gives us different kinds of photosynthesis. And you may have heard of C3 photosynthesis, C4, and CAM photosynthesis. And these are all different types of photosynthesis um, depending on what's available. So C3 is a regular type if carbon dioxide is easily available uh, during the day and stomach, stomach can be open during the day. There's a special kind of photosynthesis called C4 photosynthesis where carbon dioxide is, um, instead of joining to maybe less one five by this phosphate is joined to a four carbon molecule or fixed into a four carbon molecule called malate before going into the Calvin cycle. And this occurs across the bundle sheet cells. So there's an extra step of photosynthesis where the carbon dioxide is fixed into four carbon compound instead of a three carbon compound. And what this does is enables the stomata to stay closed without having too much photorespiration going on. So if stomata can stay closed and the plant doesn't lose water, then um, it can take it can still use it can use those lower amounts of carbon dioxide that are still there. So basically this enables the plants to use lower amounts of carbon dioxide when the stoma are closed. And if you think about a prairie, so since this is the Missouri Prairie Foundation, um, prairie grasses are exposed to you know, heat and light and wind. Um, most of the time. So it turns out that many prairie grasses, for example, are C4 plants. So they, they have the ability to keep their stomata closed during the day and, and end up with still having photosynthesis, photosynthesis occurring. Okay, so another type of photosynthesis is called CAM photosynthesis. And this is, stands for crassulation acid metabolism. And this is where carbon dioxide enters at, at night and so basically the stoma are open only at night. And once they're closed during the day, carbon, a four carbon compound is still formed. And this is generally malic acid, which is similar to malate. So the stomata can stay closed during the day and can for the synthesis. This is, occurs in a lot of succulents, things like cacti and um, portulacaceae and crassulaceae, the jade plants, any, any of your succulent plants. Um, and basically, this allows the Calvin cycle, which is the C3 cycle, to proceed um, during, during the day, um, even without extra carbon dioxide coming in. Now, so, so far, basically, we just talked about photosynthesis and what's happening there. But all of these processes are controlled by different genes that, that give rise to hormones. And hormones are basically involved in growth and photosynthesis and um, elongation of cells and even ripening of fruit and all sorts of things like that. So I did want to mention a few of the hormones that are involved in all of this, these processes. There's one hormone called auxins, which are probably the most well-known hormones. Um, IAA, endoacetic acid, is one of the main ones, and the only naturally occurring auxin. Um, this gives us what we call apical dominance. So this means that the, this apex of the plant is what's going to be growing unless you cut it off, in which case it'll, some side, side shoots will start growing. Uh, it also forms the xylem and phloem and, and a whole lot more. So auxins are very, very important and uh, they're found throughout the plant at, in various degrees and control several parts of the development. Another hormone is called cytokinins. These are involved just primarily in cell division. And I'm saying root formation too, because root formation is mostly cell division. It's rap rapid cell division downward. We think of plants as being above the soil, but really there's just as much going on below the soil as there is above the soil. And so cytokines kinins are involved in, in that. Then um, a hormone called ethylene is involved in fruit ripening. This is what gives us the ability to, say, put apples in a bag, and if one apple, apple is ripe, it will excrete ethylene as a gas to the other apples, and basically that's where you get the expression, one bad apple spoils a whole bunch, because 
it basically causes all of them to ripen fast. So you can do the same thing with, with bananas or, or any kind of fruit, um, but because that's a, a gas that escapes during in the air. It's also involved in senescence, which is losing the leaves in the fall and even fruit and uh, seeds coming out. And then another hormone is called abscisic acid. And this is involved in a very special process because the, it helps the stoma uh, close and open. And um, so it's responsible directly for preventing water loss. And it, it causes the stoma to close if, it's, if water is being lost too fast. It's also involved in seed development and basically the, all the early development of a plant. That's abscisic acid. And then finally, we have gibberellins, which are um, involved in elongating the cells and, um, and cell multiplication um, and shoots. This is what would, if, if gibberellins were high um, and cell plants were in the dark, it would cause, cause etiolation, which would mean a very tall plant. But this also is something you find in um, plants that are taller. So for example, pea plants can be either the tall type or the short type. There's more gibberellins being formed in the taller type. So it is a genetic component um, that, that you can find um, that it controls all, the, all of the height of the plants. It's also involved in seed germination and even the stimulation of flowering. So, so um, kind of in conclusion, I wanted to um, go back to our tree that's growing in the forest or a prairie and um, remind you that leaves are ultimately the very important part of the plant and they are the organs of photosynthesis. So, so next time you're outside and you see a leaf, think about it being an organ, not just something green that you can either eat or, or just um, enjoy. Um, and then wood ultimately is simply carbon dioxide and water. If we want to think of it as something more complicated than that, and then it's polymerized uh, carbon dioxide and water, but basically that's all it is. So, so all of this biomass, and if you think about wood, what it gives us, ultimately it gives us all our fuels, if fossil fuels is old wood, um, it gives us, you, know, you, can, you can burn it, you can make paper out of it, we, we use wood for all kinds of things. So um, and it all comes, boils back down to water and carbon dioxide in the leaves. Okay, and that's that's all I have. Um, I did I did want to mention a couple of references that you can, if depending on um, how, how much detail you want on something, you can go from from anywhere from a basic biology book. Campbell et al. is a good one or a biology of plants book, which is focusing just on plants, or there are plant physiology textbooks out there. And there are multiple editions of these, so I didn't put the years um, up here, but if anyone wants any more details, I can give them. All right, well, thank you. And I'll take any questions. Thank you so much. This is, it's just so incredibly, it's just on, it's, it's, it's amazing. And all life depends on these functions. We do have some questions. Um, one question about um, the light absorption. So it, violet and orange red light is absorbed, correct? Um, yes. Okay. And then, so could other wavelengths be absorbed? And if so, would we end up with a different kind of energy? Well, that's that's probably out, out of the <laughs> scope of, of anyone's knowledge, but... but um, let me go back to the wavelength if I can find it. Yeah, here we go. Um, so this is just for chlorophyll. So I will say that there are other pigments that are you know, carotenoids that, that absorb in different wavelengths. And some of them might, might absorb some green light. That all of that still goes into the light reactions of, of exciting those electrons. So, so just no matter what color the light is or what wavelength it is, it's still going into making um, make, making ATP and, and ADPH the same way. So, so there are other pigments that absorb different colors of light. And things uh, like anthocyanins are absorbing more in the green range. And so um, those are the colors that show up more in the fall. You know? so. 
Thank you. And Dan had a question. The stomata, are they largely on the leaf underside or any of them on the upper side of the leaf or are they all on the underside? Yeah, so, so that's a good question. And what that um, relates to is, is actually the species. And I'll see if I can find our picture here. Um, the species of plant. So in this photo, um, this is just a, a light micrograph of, of one species. There are stomata on the top, top and the bottom. Um, but in some species of plants, they're only going to be on the bottom. And so that, that really is a, a species specific thing. Um, so, so I'm not exactly sure how to answer that other than that's one of those things that you would have to read about that species and what's known or um, you know, look for them under a light microscope. And see which one, see see where they are, but but yes, a lot of times they're just on the bottom. Another thing that you'll see is hairs, hairs around the stomata, because that will block wind basically on a small scale level. Thank you. Um, on the uh, the question from Doug, are purple colored leaves less efficient at photosynthesis? Um. <laughs> That, that's, that's a good question. I, I think it depends on why they're purple. If they're purple um, just because they have extra pigments, then they're probably not less um, efficient. But if they're purple because the chloroplasts have died, which sometimes that's the case, uh, or there aren't any chloroplasts, like in variegated plants, like say, um, um, what am I thinking of the uh, barberry? Barberry plants, are uh, selected for their different colors and variegations and so forth. If, if it's not solid green, then those don't have as much chlorophyll in those cells. So in that case, they would be less efficient, yes. But in something like beef stick plant where the, the leaves are purple, purplish all the time, um, those have a lot of chlorophyll also. So, so it just depends a little bit. Thank you. Um, a couple questions here from Brenda. Is the water present in the area of a leaf between the cells or outside of the cells? In other words, does do the does the water flow sort of between the, the cells or is any of it going across a membrane to leave oh. through the stomata? It's it's oh for the stomata. So um yeah there's there's two ways water or two places water is found. One is in the xylem, and in the xylem, it is going across membranes. And um, the process is generally called osmosis, where water goes across membrane, and then the cells control how much water gets out into the spongy parenchyma. Mm -hmm. But if somata are open, then any water that's in here gets, can get evaporated. So, okay. um, so the answer is yes, yes to both of those things, that uh, water Water is controlled by the plant, where it, how it gets out to, to an extent. But in the case of open stomata, the, water, the evaporation is not something the plant can control other than by closing the stomata. Got it. Thank you. And um, when you talked about auxin, um, is that also a powdered rooting hormone is called auxin? And oh. Yeah. So. Um, so auxins, there's one, one um, that we know that plants themselves make, but humans can synthesize auxins also okay. and add them to roots. So, so yes, there are um, these, these hormones. I just was focusing on the ones that plants made themselves, but humans do make um, synthetic hormones that we add to, to the plant roots to make them produce more root hairs or, or grow longer, generally for elongation and so forth. But the auxin that a plant produces, that's for determining apical dominance. Is that correct? Oh, auxins do a lot of things. So, um, and there's there's the shoot apex and the root apex. So part of the, so we, we think of the shoot apex mostly just because that's what's above ground and what we can see. But there's also auxins in the root apex helping the roots grow down. So yeah, they're, they're doing that too. Thank but, you. They're very active. Um, Phil asks, direct ion exchange is important for nutrient uptake as well as direct absorption with water, correct? Is that correct? Uh, yeah, 
Yeah. I think so. Yeah, that was just was the ion exchange as important as as the water ad adsorption. Um okay. Is is it, is it as important? I think that so. I unfortunately I've um, um I don't see that I have a question anymore. Yeah, there's a lot that goes on at the root, root hair level. So um, if ion exchange is messed up in some way, it's like say the pH is way off, for example, then that can affect the water being able to get into the cells. So yeah, so so ion exchange is very important just because it, it can actually affect how, how the cells take in water. Thank you. Uh, Bob asks, does artificial light pollution impair the normal photosynthesis slash respiration cycle? Um, to my knowledge, it doesn't impair it. it. What it does impair is things like flowering time and fruiting time and those kind of things. It affects the hormones that, um, and a lot of interacts with the hormones that control when everything occurs. But I don't think it causes any harm at night. And if anything, plants plants tend to be pretty happy in the light. If they have a lot of carbon dioxide and a lot of light, they're happy. And they'll, they will grow. Now, whether they grow into a flower or a fruit, that's a different story. But plants will just continue growing with the more light and water and carbon dioxide they have. So if you had, say, a street light next to your front garden, could mm -hmm. it actually you know, be growing more at night than if the light wasn't there? Well, it depends on the wavelength of the, of the street light. I, I think that most street lights are not in a wavelength that's conducive to growing, but but if they happen to be, then sure, the plants would photosynthesize at night too. Yes. Yeah, okay. plants are pretty opportunistic. Um, Fred asks, do plant membranes have any pumps that allow water and nutrients into the interior of the cell? Yes, <laughs> yes, there, there are proton pumps. And um, so then that, that's basically how, well, water goes through membranes in two ways. One is just osmosis, which is a concentration gradient, but where the higher concentration of sugars or salts, uh, water will flow towards that higher concentration. And that, that's kind of a passive, but suppose that the cell needs to have a higher concentration of, of something, then it can pump water out, yes, through cross membranes. And you call that a float, what kind of pump? A, pro a proton pump. Oh, pro okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah usually. Um, Carla asks, what would be the specialized benefit for a plant species that have stomata on the top and the bottom of the leaves? Well, it, it would be able to get more carbon dioxide. So you would, the plant would probably um, not be in too warm of an environment, but if it's relatively cool, like you know, 70 degrees all the time or 75 degrees, let's say Fahrenheit all the time, then then it gives more um, ability for oxygen, not oxygen, carbon dioxide exchange. So like in this plant leaf, there you can see there's even air spaces in between the palisade cells here. So so this is able to take in carbon dioxide in in more places. So it just enables more, basically more photosynthesis to occur. Thank you. Um, Marjorie says, we're supposed to get some more freezing temperatures. How do plants deal with that? Well, <laughs> um, it, it depends a little bit on, on how cold it gets. If, if plant cells are um, not, I guess, cold hardened yet or whatever, if, if they're not resistant to cold and ice crystals form, that's the, the main problem with um, Freezing is ice crystals will form in the tissues and then that breaks the cells. So um, once that happens, then that's that's why you don't put, say, lettuce in the freezer because it, it'll get all mushy, right? Because all the cells will, will get broken. But certain parts of plants like bracts and um, scales and things like that are protective over, over the plants. But what happens in this time of year is if plants are budding out, mm -hmm. there's new young fresh, fragile tissue that's exposed. And if that freezes, then, then ice crystals are formed and the cells die, and then you don't have flowers usually. Um, leaves a lot of times can grow back, 
but flowers a lot of times are just the plant's ready to flower when it's ready and then if something happens then that's it it depends on the species though but yeah um, Dan asks, if a prairie grass is grazed, how does the plant react hormonally? Well, that can affect things like apical dominance um, to, to an extent. If, if the auxins are removed, then basically more, more plants will come up from the rhizomes. Um, so, so basically, it, it would encourage extra growth of, of branchlets um, from the rhizomes, as long as the plants are not completely decimated. Mm -hmm. yes. um, Jackie asks, you said that prairie grasses, or most prairie grasses, have a C4 photosynthetic pathway. What about prairie forbs or prairie um, broadleaf plants, wildlife, wild, wildflowers, for example? They're, they're more of a mixture. So um, I think it's, um, it, it, in the prairie, you probably are going to have more C4 plants than other places. Just because of the harsh conditions that, that are there. Um, but it's more of a mixture of C3 and C4 plants. Thank you. Um, another comment, if intense light is on continuously, the plant would not be able to complete its dark reactions of the Calvin-Benson cycle that typically occur at night. I don't believe light pollution from streetlights and such would affect them at all. Yeah, I'm not sure if that's a but, um the, the the dark reactions don't have to be don't have to occur in the dark. So okay. uh, the Calvin cycle occur usually it does occur in the light usually, just because that's when ATP is available and NADPH is available because of the light reactions. So I'm not sure I completely understand the question, but but um, having lights on at night is not gonna not gonna stop photosynthesis if that's the question. Thank you. Okay. Um, another question from Frank. Plants need nitrogen. Could you explain how nitrogen is involved? Okay, well. Um, or is that a, 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 for another talk? <laughs> um, well, I can point out a couple of places where nitrogen, let me see if I can get to the right place here. Um, okay, so first of all, all proteins have nitrogen in them. So, so you need the nitrogen. And um, right here at this part of the cycle, where sugar is made, fatty acids and amino acids are also made. So uh, amino acids contain nitrogen. And the nitrogen has to be uh, fixed into a form like this, like a nitrate or ammonium form for a plant to be able to use it. And usually there are nitrogen fixing bacteria in the roots, um, root nodules that can help do that. But, or there's some in the soil also. Or you can just add nitrogen and have that be taken up with the water in the roots. But, but this, it's required for all the proteins. So all of these things, um, all these steps require enzymes and um, they're made from amino acids. So, so those are definitely a very important part of the whole, whole process. Thank you. Um, uh, Walter says, I heard conversations saying that the February low temperatures in the teens ended the ma maple helicopters for this year, meaning the, the Samaras, yeah, the, yeah. The, the, I guess, I guess if the maple flowers were frozen, I guess they wouldn't form fruits or can you comment right. on that? Yeah, yeah, that's what I was saying a minute ago. If, if it freezes, if they start opening, if the flowers start opening and then it freezes, right when all that young fresh tissue is is growing or trying to grow then ice crystals form and it, the flower dies and yeah you don't end up with any fruit so yeah you won't end up with those samaras and um I, I was just traveling to south carolina i noticed that their red maples have big samaras on them already so they um whereas ours have some but maybe not as much as we would have mm -hmm. if it had not frozen like that oh, oh, one other question appears to be a lots of similarity to ATP generation in human physiology. Yes, yes, that's, that was part of my point about the membranes. So mm -hmm. um, 
humans, well, plants use, use mitochondria also, but all of the ATP produce, is produced across membranes. And it's generally, um, and plants is produced across membranes in the chloroplast and in the mitochondria. And animals, it's produced just in the mitochondria. But yes, it's the same, it's a very similar electron transport chain sort of system. The uh, electron acceptors are different as the, the, main, the main difference, and then they're in mitochondria versus in chloroplast. So, yeah, yeah, very, very similar processes. Thank you. I don't see any other questions. Um, thank you very, very much um, for this wonderful presentation. And I just wanted to remind everyone that this webinar is being re or was recorded and an email will be sent to you tomorrow with the link. Um, so you can watch it again um, or watch it for the first time if you weren't able to attend live. There will be some other helpful resources and a link to a survey. We'd love to hear your thoughts about this webinar and find out what other topics you'd like to learn about. And we have some other, um, we have some upcoming events. We hope you'll join us on March 27th for the Grow Native webinar, Gardens of Excellence, Urban Native Gar Landscape Design. Um, also, the Grow Native program is a partner with the St. Louis Partnership for Native Landscaping Educational Series, which is happening now through April 28, and some of those are in-person events and some are virtual. We also have many native plant sales coming up this spring. Um, the first one in Jefferson City on March 23rd, and then ones in April in Columbia, Kansas City, and Springfield. And in addition, we're going to have a Brews and Blooms Native Landscaping event at Civil Life um, brewery in South St. Louis on April 6th, and we'll provide links to you to all of these events um, tomorrow. And um, thank you all for tuning in and um, really uh, grateful to Dr. Bo for sharing her time and expertise with us. Everyone have a great evening. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Thank you.